else can. So thank you very much, Rachel, and uh, thank you very much to uh, Betjits UK for inviting me to give this update. It is certainly an honour to be with you, and, and I've actually been listening into some of, of what's been presented this morning, and I can already determine what a great comfort and inspiration uh, the charity must be for people with infectious disease. So the guidelines are UK guidelines, and they're guidelines that are jointly being created between the British Association of Dermatology and the British Society of Rheumatology. Um, can have the next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, and there's no real reason why you should, um, this is just a, a brief bio of some of the things I've been involved in. And I think the important areas are that I've been a consultant dermatologist for over 20 years. My case mix is adult and children. Um, I have an interest in where dermatology meets rheumatology and in genital and oral medicine. And so it's probably no surprise that I've become interested in Beckett's disease and, and have actually um, meet patients through oral clinics, through genital clinics and through the interface clinics with rheumatology. Um, I've held three consultant posts and um, taken the interest with me to all three of them and I'm currently a consultant at Sheffield Deakin Hospitals. I've been involved in a number of um, guidelines um, to do with the National Institute of Clinical Excellence and the British Association of Dermatology and also Cochrane Systematic Reviews. Um, so that's my background and, and why I'm here and why I'm involved because I've realised that many of you won't have met me before. Can I have the next slide, please? So why have these guidelines? ULA provided some very good um, guidelines um, relatively recently, and you, you may ask, what more can we add? Well, I think for, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here, but the assembled audience knows how difficult it is to diagnose Beckett's disease and then how difficult it is to provide um, appropriate therapy to give a control of symptoms, some of which might be um, very difficult to define. They may be fatigue and pain. There might not be um, many studies supporting uh, appropriate treatments. And the way forward for any rare condition is to show robust met methodology, to develop guidelines to identify uh, research areas, and that gives a very firm foundation when requesting future funding. I did feel that though it was important to drive um, a greater understanding for all healthcare professionals, you know, many people with infectious disease, have mucocutaneous disease and they are presenting to dermatology, to oral medicine, to GU medicine, to gynecology and sometimes they will present with arthralgia to rheumatology in, in very severe cases because it's any vessel anywhere in the body. There may be these acute presentations to ophthalmology, to neurology and if there is ulceration in the GI tract or or bladder, or indeed anywhere in the body, to the relevant specialist. So I think it's important to provide a guideline that, that actually creates base, greater understanding uh, with the medical profession as a whole. It's important to try and get some treatment algorithms that are based on the most robust methodology that allows all the phenotypes of Beckett's disease to be um, to be represented. And I think it's also important to stress the need for the multi-professional input. But identifying these uh, future research areas are all important in a, in a disorder that is, is even now quite poorly understood. Can I have the next slide, please? So with that vision in mind, uh, we put together the guidelines group and, and as you can see here, it represents individuals from throughout the UK uh, with a number of um, relevant specialties representing both adults and children. We also have uh, Professor Jellick from Istanbul University. We have our um, guidelines methodologists. We have patient representation. Um, we have um, 
we have representation from pharmacy and um, the we, we're observed in our practices uh, by Tony Thornburn and by uh, currently by the British Society of Rheumatology, though ultimately we will end up with joint guidelines. Can I have the next slide, please? The way guidelines are derived are using a type of methodology called GRADE. And GRADE has been adopted by the WHO, Cochrane, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, its counterpart in Scotland, and around 100 other organisations. And, and, and I know this, you know, seems a, a little bit um, maybe anal in some respect in the way I'm describing this, but, but actually having a, a very um, good methodology and sound methodology does mean that when grant applications are put in for areas of research, then any data that has been developed um, is much more likely to pass scrutiny and increase chances of uh, funding applications. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. Now, the evidence, all guidelines are based on an evidence hierarchy. And even though experts are important, um, expert opinion actually is considered the lowest level of, of evidence. And that isn't to say that, that the experts aren't important because they absolutely are. But what is really important is that we, we generate trial data. Um, to show efficacy of, of how interventions, uh, how effective interventions are. And the highest level of evidence is a, a systematic review, but for, for all intents and purposes, most guidelines um, aspire to uh, random controlled trial evidence and look to see how many uh, papers are published. Uh, meeting uh, those criteria of the interventions which have been predetermined and then work downwards. And sometimes for a rare, very rare disorders um, that I've been involved with, there aren't any RCTs hardly and most of the evidence is just presented in, in tabulated form. The um, guidelines for Beckett's disease, though, will have quite a lot of RCT uh, data, so that's a, a good starting point. But we will, it looks like we will be relying on, on less robust um, information as well. Um, but that's, that's okay because it points the future direction for research. Can I have the next slide, please? So the advantages of using GRADE rather than any other system are listed here. I've highlighted some areas which I think are particularly important. This, this type of methodology has the explicit acknowledgement of patient values and preferences, and patients are a really important part of the group. There is also a clear separation between the quality of the evidence and the strength of the recommendations, which I'll detail a, a little later, and a transparent process of moving the evidence. So that's the evidence from looking at the RCTs and um, other types of studies, and actually looking at that evidence, weighing up uh, its the level of robustness and linking it to the recommendations within the guidelines. And if this sounds a bit gobbledygook at the moment, hopefully if I come and speak to you at the end of the guidelines, it'll all make a lot more sense. But, but what is important is we're actually looking at the evidence. We are synthesizing, we're assessing it for bias and for robustness. Um, we are then linking it to what is considered to be important in the treatment of the conditions as determined by both the, the, the medical experts and the patients who suffer from the, from the disorders. Uh, please can have the next slide. So what it actually does is the quality of evidence using GRADE just to, to sort of represent the hierarchy model. It can it, it looks at randomized controlled trials as the highest level of evidence, um, and then you have the observational studies at a lower level of evidence, at non RCT trials, um, cohort case control studies, case series, um, that type of, uh, of study. Um, and 
the, there is a bit of terminology and I'm going to skip through slides that follow, but for every single um, paper that's pulled, um, then it is actually assessed for a level of um, biases and, lim and study limitations in line with uh, the Cochrane collaboration. And uh, from that, we determine uh, the quality of evidence and that then leads into the strength of recommendations that are made. Can I have the next slide? It is really a, a very laborious process. And in the old days, um, the uh, members of the guidelines group had to do this. Um, fortunately, uh, certainly at the BAD, the British Association of Dermatologists, we've actually now employed uh, methodologies to extract the data. Um, and this is a massively time consuming process of every single article that's deemed relevant to the guidelines, then um, th that has to be gone through in detail, the number of participants identified, the various biases identified, and then we look at the number of studies that are, are using uh, similar interventions and so on. And from that, tables are generated, which, called, which is called an evidence profile. And at the moment, we have been able to um, get to this stage for the RCT data only in infectious disease. So this has been step one. And we met um, a week or so ago, a couple of weeks ago, and went through um, the, the data from the RCT evidence uh, alone. And to give you some idea, I think we were on the um, conference for about five or six hours and that is a small small um a, a, you know, reflection of the time that somebody has spent actually going through the the rc hours now it's now so there's always you know time between each step can i have the next slide And then what happens is that the evidence is presented in, in a sort of traffic light system from high quality to, to very low quality with the descriptors as shown. And then the next slide, please. And what GRADE does, which is really great, it actually um, challenges the developers to actually uh, look at which of the outcomes are most important um, for patients and, and they're graded from one to nine. So for those um, that are shown between seven and nine will be critical for decision making. So to give you some idea, infectious disease, that might be something along the lines of quality of life, frequency of flares. Obviously, we wouldn't want to be um, recommending any treatment that themselves produce very severe, serious adverse effects. And so what, what happens is that we look at the evidence, we weigh up um, strengths and weaknesses of the, um, of the study. We look at the um, interventions, we look at there's any side effects, but at every point we go back to the patients to ensure that what we're capturing is important to the individuals who matter the most, and that is those who are affected. Next slide, please. Um, so again, a little bit texty, but it's just because I know that you're archiving some of these slides and you might want to look back on them later. So this is factors that determine the strength of the recommendations. And these are listed here. Um, desirable effects that you might be looking for in a study and then the undesirable effects. Um, and that actually um, allows um, for, as I say, every stage checks and balancing balances that we're actually coming up with recommendations that are helpful to the patient. Next slide, please. And what happens is at the end of this hugely lengthy process, where we go through hundreds of papers, um, you, we end up with uh, recommendations which usually are either strong or weaker. And you, depending on the strength of, of, of the um, of, of the data that we've got that then feeds into this bit of how we link the evidence um, to um, the, the guideline. And can I have the next slide, please? 
And what happens is, and we NICE have adopted this this um, wording, um, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, but obviously NICE use GRADE in the same way we are. And the, the take home message is the guidelines will, will be couched in, in terminology where for some things we will say offer and for other things we will say consider. And the reason that the word offer is chosen over the word consider, it actually maps back to the strength of evidence from the papers that we went through. So if we have got um, RCT data, overwhelming data for a therapeutic information, which is very, very um, safe, that, that the patients think is important um, for their condition and the experts or the, you know, the, the, the medical, uh, assembled medical professionals agree, then when we are linking evidence to the recommendations in that letter document, we will use the word offer. If the, uh, if the data that we've got is strong as RCT, but there is still some sort of signal coming through, and even if there are some biases, but the, the general feeling between the assembled group is that actually their experience is that this does this intervention is helpful in practice, and, and there is a lower level of evidence of that to support its use, then we would use the word consider. And uh, with a disorder like Lecture's disease, it may be that quite a lot of the recommendations are in the consider group, but that isn't a worry because if you want to move it to offer, then that's a reason to perhaps apply for funding for an RCT for, um, for new therapies or existing therapies, which could be repurposed. Um, so, you know, all this, all, all these steps are ways of, of making very well-founded and robust arguments for more interest and more study into Betches. Can I have the next slide, please? And, and I think that um, the most important thing in life is you have to make a decision and do something. Um, you know, the proverbial um, donkey that that couldn't was stuck on the bridge because he couldn't decide which um, side he was moving to. Um, is um, it is an apocryphal tale, but at the end of the day, you have to start somewhere to to affect change. And this society has clearly, in in my involvement, um, which has been minor, has done an awful lot for Betches disease, um, and the and continue, will continue to do so. And I'm hoping that the UK guidelines uh, in making a decision to do it um, will actually improve um, the patient care in the future and certainly the ability of the healthcare professionals all over the world to be more secure in their diagnosis and the management of these patients. We have identified the RCT data we're moving to the non-RCT uh, trials and we're beginning to write the narrative and I have a meeting in a couple of weeks to discuss the skeleton outline of that narrative and that will capture some of the softer aspects that might not be reflected in trials but things that, that all of us who treat patients with Betcher's disease know are important to our patients. So I hope that's been helpful and thank you for listening. Ruth, thank you very much. That's great. There was one question uh, which well, that Sharon Wheeler posed uh, and Dr. Diva Sidnaki has, has um, answered it online. It was how are these guidelines considered by the medical community, e.g. is there a hierarchy? So is NICE considered first, for example? Very, very yes, yeah. I mean... Yeah, the guide, any guideline that, so for example, the British Association of Dermatology, the most downloaded and cited of all its papers usually involves a high percentage of the guidelines. Um, which are published for all specialties. And the reason for that is because they are derived in a very robust way. And so I would say that um, any guideline that uses grade methodology is considered both by funding bodies, um, by politicians, um, 
you know, sort of at the highest level of how guidelines are developed. Um, mm. So they're considered very positive. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time with that very thorough presentation. That's brilliant. You're very welcome.